Hi, I'm Mr. Loomis. Welcome back for our fifth lesson about the Cold War. Today we're going to be talking about quite a few different topics. None of these are as flashy as the Berlin Airlift, Korean War, arms race, or Cuban Missile Crisis. So sometimes students of history don't get to learn about this part of the Cold War. But they're important for us to understand why Americans thought communism was so bad, and also for us to reflect on our own country and what we did to other people because of the Cold War. Before we begin, let's take a look at our topics. We'll start with the kitchen debate, which didn't really happen in a kitchen. We'll learn about how the Soviet Union stopped people from having freedom in Hungary and Czechoslovakia, and by using the secret police. Then we'll learn about how the Soviets and Americans tried to get along during a time called detente. And we'll finish today by learning about the proxy wars, which were some of the worst wars of the Cold War era. Let's get started. During the Cold War, the United States and the Soviet Union tried to outdo the other with bombers, missiles, ships, and guns. The kitchen debates of 1959 were different. They were one of the only times the leaders of the two great countries actually met to debate face to face. In 1959, the Soviets and Americans had agreed to hold exhibits or shows in each other's countries to try to help their people understand each other. The Soviet exhibit was in New York and the American exhibit in Moscow. Over 450 American companies had provided things they made to show what life in the United States was like. Vice President Richard Nixon went to Moscow when the American show opened and took Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev on a tour of the exhibit. The kitchen debate is the name was that, that was given to their conversations at these tours. The American exhibit had many new inventions like televisions, refrigerators, and dishwashers that few Soviet homes had. In front of the news cameras, Nixon tried to convince Khrushchev that the capitalist or free market system was better than communism. Clearly, the exhibit showed the good things that competition could bring to regular people. Nixon said that the Soviets should not be afraid of ideas. Khrushchev was not impressed. He said that the Soviets would have all the same things in a few years. He argued that the Soviets built things to last for many years. It's true that ever since the 1920s, the United States has more and more turned into a consumer-driven economy, which new inventions were being replaced often. Just think of the pace at which companies like Apple or Samsung produce phones that make last year's model old. This is not always good. But Khrushchev's claim that building things to last for many years was not great either. The Soviet model of building for the future often meant boring, gray, concrete buildings and science that Americans thought of as old-fashioned. In the United States, three major, the three major television channels showed the kitchen debate. Some people thought it was just a political show, but many people were impressed with Nixon and how he argued with the Soviet leader. The debates made Nixon more famous and helped him become the Republican presidential candidate the next year. In the end, the kitchen debate did not change the opinion of leaders on either side of the Iron Curtain. It did, however, show how different capitalism and communism were, and how different the lives of the people who lived with these two systems were. Although leaders in the Soviet Union were not about to become a free market economy or democracy, the same could not be said for the people of Eastern Europe. They were unhappy, and there were revolutions in both Hungary and Czechoslovakia. Soviet Premier Joseph Stalin had said, everyone imposes his system as far as his army can reach. When the Soviet army marched across Eastern Europe at the end of World War II, Stalin's dream of growing communism became real. When the war ended, the Soviets set up communist governments in the puppet states of the Eastern Bloc. Like the American army, which stayed in West Germany, Soviet soldiers stayed in East Germany in the Warsaw Pact countries of the East. But having Soviet soldiers and communism in their countries did not make the people of the Eastern Bloc happy. The Hungarian uprising of 1956 
was a revolt against the government of Hungary and the laws the Soviet Union made them follow. It was the first major attack on Soviet control since the Red Army drove the Germans out of Hungary at the end of World War II. The revolt began as a protest by thousands of students who marched through the capital city of Budapest. When some of the students entered the radio building to try to broadcast the students' ideas for change, the government police attacked them. One student was killed. As the news of what happened spread, violence broke out throughout the country. The revolt took the Hungarian communist leaders by surprise, and they lost control of the country. The new government got rid of the old communist leaders and their police, said it would leave the Warsaw Pact, and promised free elections. Things settled down, and Hungary began to return to normal. At first, the Soviets said they would take its soldiers out of Hungary. But Soviet leaders changed their minds and moved to stop the revolution. A large Soviet army entered Hungary. The Hungarians fought back for a week before being crushed by the Soviet invasion. Over 2,500 Hungarians and 700 Soviet troops were killed, and 200,000 Hungarians left the country. A new Soviet-backed communist government returned and stopped all protests. They arrested thousands of people who had been part of the First Rebellion and passed laws to stop people from even talking about what had happened. About 10 years after the failed Hungarian Revolution, the government of another member of the Eastern Bloc briefly fought against Soviet rule. The Czechoslovakian government began to open up the economy and political system. This short period was called the Prague Spring, named for the country's capital city. The Soviets did not like these changes and sent half a million Warsaw Pact soldiers and tanks into Czechoslovakia to force the government there to go back to Soviet-style communism. Across the country, people worked against the Soviets. They painted over and turned street signs to confuse the Soviets. They broke laws, and one protest protester, John Pollock, set himself on fire in Prague's Wenceslas Square to protest for freedom of speech. While the Soviet army had thought it would take just four days to take back the country, resistance held out for eight months. In the end, however, the hope for real change was crushed by the Soviet army. It would be another 20 years before the people of Czechoslovakia enjoyed basic rights. In the case of the revolutions in Hungary and Czechoslovakia, the Soviet Union had to use its army to get what it wanted. Normally, however, in the Soviet Union and the world's other communist countries, the government used fear and surveillance or spying to control the people. In most dictatorships, both communist and non-communist, the normal police departments are helped by the secret police. In the Soviet Union, the secret police was called the KGB. In East Germany, they were known as the Stasi, in China as the Juntong, in North Korea as the State Security Department. No matter what they're called, they all work the same way. The people of the Soviet Union, Eastern Europe, China, Vietnam, Cuba, and North Korea knew they were being watched, that the secret police were listening to their phone calls, reading their mail, and keeping track of where they traveled, where they shopped, and who they talked to. If they did something the government didn't like, they knew the secret police would find out. To protect themselves, people promised the secret police that they would keep an eye on their neighbors. After the Cold War ended, historians read the Stasi's file and found out that almost every single person in East Germany had been so afraid of the secret police that they had promised to tell them about their neighbors. If the secret police thought that someone was planning a protest, sharing information that would hurt the government, or trying to leave the country, that person would be arrested, tortured, put in jail, or killed. People in the communist world were afraid of the midnight knock of the secret police. They heard about family members and friends who had just disappeared. Most secret police forces had a secret system of camps or jails for these political prisoners. In the China, the system was called Lao Gai, which means reform through labor. In reality, reform meant punishment. Prisoners who were let out were warnings to their friends and family of the power of the government. The most famous of all labor camps in the communist world, however, were the gulags of the Soviet Union. 
Gulag was started by Vladimir Lenin right after he took over Russia and turned it into the Soviet Union. It was a collection of forced labor camps. The camps held a wide range of prisoners, from regular criminals to people who had worked against Lenin and the communist government. Large numbers of people were sent to the Gulag without a trial by groups of three government judges called Troikas. The Gulags reached its peak during Joseph Stalin's rule when more than 100,000 people were sent to the Gulags. Alexander Solzhenitsyn, winner of the 1970 Nobel Prize in Literature, survived eight years in the Gulag and made the camps famous with his book, The Gulag Archipelago, in 1973. The author compared the camps to an archipelago, a chain of islands, and he wrote about the gulags as places where people worked to death. Most of the people who entered the gulag did come out alive, but being alive did not mean a return to normal life. Former prisoners were usually not allowed to move into large cities or see their families again. Even after they were released, the government was still afraid their ideas might spread. We're going to shift now and talk about a time in the 1970s when the Americans and Soviets tried to get along and the Cold War was not so hot. It was called detente. After the Cuban Missile Crisis, the United States and the Soviet Union took a step back from the edge of war and leaders on both sides decided that the arms race, space race, was always acting like they were about to go to war was not smart. By the 1970s, the two countries had started to lower the chance of war and work together in science and culture. This time is known by the French word, détente. The leaders most involved with détente were President Richard Nixon and his national security advisor, Dr. Henry Kissinger. They did not think of the Cold War as a moral struggle about good and evil. Both of them saw the world and the fight between the United States and Soviet Union in terms of real politic, that is, they thought the fight between East and West was about what each side needed and could get. Both superpowers had needs, such as security, ports, raw materials, allies, and honor. Nixon and Kissinger thought that the capitalist and communist countries could share the world so long as leaders found ways for both sides to get what they needed. The most clear example of detente were meetings held between the leaders of the two superpowers and the treaties or agreements that came from these meetings. Among these agreements were the Partial Test Ban Treaty, which ended all nuclear tests in the air, underwater, or in space. Only tests underground were allowed. Later, the Outer Space Treaty banned nuclear weapons in space, and the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty slowed the spread of nuclear weapons. While Kennedy and Johnson in the 1960s did their part to lessen the Cold War, most of the detente treaties happened after Nixon became president in 1969. The United States and Soviet Union signed the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty, SALT I, in 1972. This treaty limited each country's total number of nuclear weapons, ending the arms race. In the same year that SALT I was signed, the Biological Weapons Convention and the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty were also signed. To follow up on their work, the two countries began working on a second treaty to limit nuclear weapons, known as SALT II. In 1975, the leaders of the major countries in both the East and the West met and produced the Helsinki Accords, which dealt with many topics. The Soviet Union had started the discussion, and the agreement was signed by 35 countries from Europe and North America. The Accords were a big political win for Leonard Brezhnev, the new leader of the Soviet Union, because the United States promised to respect the borders of the countries of Eastern Europe. However, the courts also said countries must respect human rights, something the communists were not known for, and the West often pointed to the agreements when criticizing the secret police in the Soviet Union and other communist countries. Detente went beyond politics and weapons. In July of 1975, the Apollo Soyuz test project became the first international space mission when three American astronauts and two Soviet cosmonauts connected their spacecraft. To prepare, American and Soviet engineers from NASA and the Soviet Space Agency had worked together for five years. A lot more trade was done between East and West during the years of detente. One of the most important 
was the large amount of wheat sent from America to the Soviet Union each year, which the Soviet Union needed because their large government farms were not able to grow enough food. Even as the United States stood ready with nuclear weapons to defend against Soviet attack, American farmers were feeding the people of their worst enemy. President Nixon and Dr. Kissinger were excited to find ways to manage the Cold War. But in the Soviet Union, detente was seen differently. Leonard Brezhnev, the leader of the Soviet Union from 1964 to 1982, wanted to use this quiet period to get the Soviet Union ready to grow. 1979, he ordered an attack on Afghanistan, one of the Soviet Union's southern neighbors. Like all other foreign attacks into this huge country of mountains, the Soviets failed. But the Soviet attack on Afghanistan was a big reason President Ronald Reagan, elected in 1980, chose to end detente. We're going to finish today with the story of the proxy wars of the Third World. Well, there was never any direct fighting between the Soviet Union and the United States during the Cold War, which is why we call it Cold War, now Hot War. There was definitely fighting. Let's take a look. As old colonies became independent after World War II, the Third World started to appear in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. This became a major battleground of the Cold War, as the United States and the Soviet Union tried to spread their ideas to these countries. Across the Third World, the two superpowers faced off in many proxy wars. We'll begin with Latin America. The United States had a long and has had a long and often bad relationship with its southern neighbors. The Monroe Doctrine told European nations not to get involved in Latin America, while the Roosevelt Corollary said that the United States would. America had taken half of the land of Mexico at the end of the Mexican-American War in the 1840s, taken Puerto Rico from this, uh, after the Spanish-American War, and had interfered in Cuba, Panama, and the various banana republics of Central America, even before the Cold War began. It was mostly about business. Americans wanted land for coffee, sugar, and fruit plantations in Central America and the Caribbean. But the Cold War changed the rules of the game. The United States no longer needed to support governments that would be okay with American business. Now, the most important thing was that Latin American leaders fight communism. The United States began to support strong men who were bad to their people, violated human rights, and made themselves rich. Fulgencio Bautista of Cuba and Rafael Trujillo of the Dominican Republic were two of the worst. While some Americans did not like this, leaders in Washington who liked the idea of containment and believed in the domino theory thought it was necessary. Another Latin American country affected by the Cold War was Chile. For many years, Chile had been a model in South America of good democratic government. Elected leaders had held office and turned over power peacefully. The army stayed out of politics. That changed in 1973. The new president, Salvador Allende, tried to make changes that were very similar to changes communist leaders had made in other places. Cuba's Fidel Castro visited Chile and supported Allende. But Allende was different in that he did not want a revolution. He believed in working slowly through elections. In normal times, the United States might have ignored Allende. But in the middle of the Cold War, the CIA saw Allende as a dangerous example. If Chile took a peaceful path away from capitalism, other countries might want to do the same. Augusto Pinochet, the commander-in-chief of the Chilean army, led a coup and took power from Allende. Although the United States had not helped Pinochet, the CIA knew what Pinochet was planning. Pinochet correctly thought that if the CIA did not try to stop him, they also wanted to get rid of Allende. Allende shot himself just before being taken prisoners by Pinochet's soldiers. Pinochet went on to rule Chile as a dictator for the next 17 years. His secret police murdered over 2,000 people. But he was very anti-communist, so the United States supported him. Panama was another Latin American country where America supported anti-communist leader. Manuel Noriega, the dictator of Panama, had been paid by the CIA for years. He was in the drug trade. But America paid him to let the CIA set up listening stations in his country to spy on communists. In Central America, the Cold War had even more dangerous effects. In the 1970s and 1980s, 
war is started between the poor and the rich who own the land. These problems started hundreds of years before the Cold War, and these wars would have happened even without the Cold War. But the Cold War made the civil wars in Guatemala, El Salvador, and Nicaragua worse because they were like mini versions of the Cold War. Basically, the Americans and Soviets picked sides, and we saw the wars in Central America as representative of our larger struggle. If our side was losing in this civil war, we thought we must be losing the Cold War. That's why these wars are known as proxy wars, because they were proxies or representative of the larger Cold War. Like pouring gas on a fire, guns, money, and helpers from the United States and Soviet Union made the wars much longer and many more people died than might have if not for the help of the Americans and Soviets. The wars were especially hard on the poor. So they tried to stop communism in Latin America. The CIA and the Army's School of the Americas taught Latin American army officers how to torture and kill. In 1996, the Pentagon was forced to show the books they had used at the School of the Americas. These books taught Latin American army leaders how to kill civilians, lock people up without trials, torture and threaten people. War crimes and human rights violations such as these made many Americans upset. But as we tried to stop the spread of communism, some felt that anything was okay, as long as communists did not win. The Soviet Union did the same. They sent helpers, guns, and money to help their side in the proxy wars. They even sent tanks to Nicaragua to help their side. In general, the Soviets helped the poor, and the Americans sided with the landowners, government, and military. In the end, most of the people who died were poor, or union members, teachers, students, human rights workers, writers, priests, and nuns who had helped the poor. Of all the people trying to stop the wars and to protect innocent people, Oscar Romero, the Archbishop of San Salvador, was the most trusted and the strongest. In 1977, the same year Romero became Archbishop, his friend Rutilio Grande was killed by government soldiers. Grande was a Jesuit priest who'd been working in the countryside, and his death changed Romero. He tried to get the government to investigate, but they wouldn't listen. Romero began speaking out against the war, poverty, how things were not fair, and how the army was torturing people. Romero also spoke against the United States for giving money to the army in El Salvador, and wrote to President Jimmy Carter in 1980, telling him that more American money would just make things worse. Carter ignored Romero, money continued to be sent to the Salvadoran government. In 1980, Romero gave a sermon in which he called on Salvadoran soldiers as Christians to follow God's higher order and to stop following the government's orders to kill or violate basic human rights. The next evening, Romero was shot in the heart. The archbishop died instantly. Romero's funeral mass at San Salvador Cathedral was attended by more than 250,000 people from all over the world. Even during the ceremony, smoke bombs exploded in the streets near the cathedral and there were rifle shots from buildings nearby, including the National Palace. Some 30 to 50 people were killed. Some people said government soldiers had fired the shots, but no one is sure. The wars in Central America were long, terrible, and made worse by the Cold War. Today, most people look back with sadness and regret at the part that the great powers played in the killing. In El Salvador, Oscar Romero stood up to powerful forces to demand peace and basic human rights in the same way that Gandhi had done many years before. He is still beloved hero of the common people across Latin America and an international symbol of how the Cold War hurt people in the third world. The Middle East, another part of the third world, was a place with many problems for the United States during the Cold War, and it still is today. America is most worried about protecting Israel and being able to get the oil from around the Persian Gulf. Israel was created in the land of Palestine at the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea after World War II as a new country for the Jewish people who had lived through the Holocaust. The United States officially recognized Israel in 1948. This gave us a strong new friend but also created many enemies. The United Nations had tried to negotiate borders for the new country, but the non-Jewish Palestinians, who had lived there for hundreds of years, did not like the plan. 
the Jewish settlers went to war, and millions of Arabs ended up moving away. Upset that the Americans helped the new Jewish country, Israel's Arab neighbors turned to the Soviet Union for help. In the end, the United States ended up dealing with problems in many Middle Eastern countries because of the Cold War. When the Soviet Union attacked Afghanistan in 1979, Americans gave weapons to the Afghan people, fighting back. When Iran and Iraq went to war, the Americans helped Iran, while the Soviets helped Iraq. In 1983, the radical group Hezbollah set off a bomb at the Marine Barracks in Beirut, Lebanon, killing 241 American Marines. The attack was probably revenge for America's actions in the Middle East. However, over time it became clear that America's main reason to be in the Middle East were Israel and oil, not containment of communism. After the Cold War ended, the Middle East was the first place the United States went to war, and more Americans have died fighting in the Middle East in the past 30 years than every other corner of the world combined. That concludes today's lesson. Before we go, let's recap our big ideas. The kitchen debates between Richard Nixon and Nikita Khrushchev in 1959 were one of the only times communist and capitalist leaders debated their ideas face to face. Twice, people in Eastern Europe tried to fight to get rid of their communist governments. 1959, people in Hungary rebelled. In 1968, people in Czechoslovakia rebelled. Both times, the Soviet Union sent in soldiers to protect communist leaders. Communist governments used fear to stay in power. People who spoke out against the government were arrested, thrown in jail, and sometimes disappeared. People knew that the secret police might appear at any moment, so they tried not to do anything that might put themselves in danger. People in communist countries were obedient, but unhappy. In the 1970s, American leaders decided that there was little chance of getting rid of communism. They decided to find ways to share the world peacefully. The United States and Soviet Union signed treaties to stop testing nuclear weapons and to start to get rid of some of their nuclear weapons. They even worked together to meet in space and shake hands. This time it was called detente. Both the United States and Soviet Union gave money and weapons to people around the world. These were the proxy wars and the United States and Soviet Union tried to help their side win. Sometimes we helped countries with terrible leaders just because they were anti-communist. In Central America, when the poor started a revolution against the rich, the Soviet Union supported the poor and the United States helped the rich people who controlled the government. Because both superpowers were giving money and weapons to their side, the civil wars lasted a long time and thousands of people died who might have lived if the Cold War had not been raging. Similar problems happened in the Middle East. Thank you very much for sticking with me through a long lesson. In our next and final lesson about the Cold War, we're going to learn about how it ended and what are the shadows of the Cold War we can still see in our lives today. I'll see you then.